15 minute or less lecture series, Anatomy and Physiology, Chapter 6, Integumentary System. The integumentary system consists of the skin or integument, which is the largest organ of the body, the subcutaneous layer deep to the skin, which is mostly made of adipose tissue, and other accessory structures such as hair, nails, sweat glands, and so on. Here's an image of a cadaver with the skin intact and with the skin removed to show the subcutaneous layer. The functions of the skin include thermoregulation, helping to regulate our body temperature, protection of underlying tissues, uh, helps to slow down the loss of water through the skin, um, houses many sensory receptors. There's some excretion of materials through secretion, so from sweat, from the oil glands, and also the beginning of DNA synthesis starts off in the skin. Here is a cartoon image of the integumentary system where we have the skin, which consists of the superficial epidermis. Below that is the dermis where many, many accessory structures are embedded. And then deep to that, the subcutaneous layer. The epidermis is composed of many layers of cells. It is a stratified squamous epithelium. So the cells near the surface are flat. And like all epithelial tissue, the epidermis is avascular. This is why you can put a pin through a callus and not have any bleeding occur. Also, of course, worth noting, the epidermis is attached to the dermis partly by the basement membrane, another feature of all epithelial tissue. The first layer of the epidermis is called the stratum basale. Stratum basale is a single cell layer thick. It is well nourished by capillaries that are in the dermis and located near the epidermis. And this is where all cells divide. So all cell division for the epidermis occurs here in the stratum basale. As cells divide, they get pushed up above the stratum basale and they then push the cells above them further up and those push the ones above them further up and so on so that slowly over time cells will migrate from the lowest layer all the way up to the most superficial layer during this process these cells will become keratinized aka they will fill up with tough fibrous waterproof proteins called keratin however as they become keratinized these cells will die this is an example of apoptosis, programmed cell death. And it's worth noting that these primary cells are called keratinocytes. So after the stratum basale comes the stratum spinosum. This is, oh, eight to 10 layers of cells in the stratum spinosum layer. They are pointy shaped because they are forming tight connections with their neighboring cells via desmosomes. Hence the name stratum spinosum, spinosum for spiny. And here the cells are still alive. Cells so further later on get pushed up into stratum granulosum. Here the cells start to flatten a little bit. The cells start to de 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 degrade as they are entering the keratinization process, forming many, many keratin proteins inside their cells. And it's also here that they will release a waterproof substance to help give the skin resistance to water loss. Here, though, the cells are still alive. After that, if we're talking about thick skin, say in the palm of the hands or sole of the feet, uh, you'll have the layer called stratum lucidum. Stratum lucidum is four to five layers thick and relatively clear looking. Here, the cells are now dead. And then above that, superficial to that, is stratum corneum. Stratum corneum can be anywhere from 20 to hundreds of layers of cells thick, depending on where it is located. These cells are completely dead now. They are just bags of keratin proteins and super flat. So again, apoptosis has occurred. Here's an image of thick skin compared to thin skin. Thick skin is only found in the soles of the feet and the palms of the hands. And besides having extremely thick stratum corneum and also stratum lucidum, the thick skin is further differentiated from thin skin because it has no hair follicles. And with no hair follicles, there are also no sebaceous glands or oil glands. Calluses are where a certain area of the skin has been stimulated to increase cell growth. That then leads to thickening of stratum corneum. 
because of increased friction to that area, whether it's, say, a callus on your thumb from playing the guitar or from, uh, say, holding something against a part of your body regularly, leading to rubbing and friction. Melanocytes is another kind of cell found in the epidermis. The melanocytes uh, live on stratum basale and then have these uh, extensions that push up into stratum spinosum. There, they will deposit the pigment melanin into the keratinocytes. So melanocytes produce this pigment, deposit it into the keratinocytes, and the pigment will then absorb UV radiation to help protect cells and their nucleuses from that radiation. Occasionally, a melanocyte will become uh, stimulated to overgrow, and when that happens, you will form what's called a mole, as shown here. Skin color is determined by a combination of genetic elements, the environment, and some physiological factors. As to genetics, uh, some people pr have their melanocytes produce more amounts of melanin than other people, thereby giving that person a darker skin color and therefore greater protection against UV light. Environmental factors basically are just how much exposure you get to sunlight or the equivalent in the form of UV light from sun lamps and x-rays. This causes an increased amount of production of melanin. Some people like to do this, they call it tanning. I don't recommend it. Other things that can cause skin color to change is cyanotic uh, conditions, where there's a lack of oxygen in certain areas of the body, leading to a bluish color to the skin, the nail, nail beds, other mucous membranes. There's jaundice, a yellowish color to the skin and whites of the eyes, usually caused by liver disease. Arrhythmia, a redness of the skin, could be caused by a minor injury, by exposure to heat, by a minor sunburn, inflammation, or even allergic reaction. And then pallor or a paleness of the skin that can be caused by a person going into shock or suffering from anemia. The dermis is deep to the epidermis and it binds the epidermis to the underlying cytokine layer. And within the dermis are many, many different structures. So when we look at the dermis, as shown here in this cartoon, we see that at the interface between the epidermis and dermis, the dermis has these uh, little hills that push up into the epidermis. They are called the dermal papilla for one, dermal papillae for many, and they help increase the contact between the epidermis and dermis and hold them tightly together so that the epidermis does not separate. In some areas, the dermal papillae are extremely large, aka the thick skin, and this leads to the uh, formation of fingerprints on the palms of our hands and our fingertips and our bottoms of our feet. And the fingerprints then also allow for increased um, surface areas so that we are better able to manipulate material with our hands. Here is some images of fingerprints. The other thing to point out about fingerprints and the areas where they are found, aka the thick skin, there are a lot of extra sweat glands so that your hands and feet can get a little extra sweaty, say, when you're nervous about something. Within the dermal papillae, you will also find uh, many blood capillaries. This means the capillaries are near the interface between the dermis and the epidermis and can provide nutrients for the epidermis, remove waste, and also carry heat to the surface of the skin so that heat can be lost. The dermis is made up of two main types of connective tissue, the areolar connective tissue, which will include collagen and elastic fibers, and the dense connective tissue, which has many, many collagen fibers, some elastic fibers, and gives the dermis a lot of strength and elasticity so that it can resist forces, aka our skin won't tear just because it gets pulled on. You also can find tactile corpuscles. These are touch receptors near the interface with the epidermis. And then deeper in the dermis, you can find laminated corpuscles, which are important for the sensation of pressure, how much something's pushing on the skin. Also, turns out that there is a smooth muscle structure associated with every single hair follicle. This is called the erector pili muscle. And when this muscle contracts, it will cause goosebumps to form. When you look at the hair follicle, you have the outer hair structure, including a bulge. Uh, this is the follicle per se. And then inside the hair follicle will be the hair root. 
the portion of the hair within the dermis versus the hair shaft, the portion of the hair sticking out of the skin. Also associated with every hair follicle are the sebaceous glands or oil glands. So they produce oil for the skin and hair. Uh, throughout all of the skin, we have meroquine sweat glands. These are the normal sweat glands that have ducts going to the surface that release what we think of as sweat. Below the dermis is the subcutaneous layer. Subcutaneous layer is primarily adipose tissue and some areolar connective tissue. Its functions include insulation to prevent heat loss and also as a shock absorber so we can bump into things without injuring underlying structures. And also found moving through the subcutaneous layer to the dermis are many blood vessels and nerves. Accessory structures include the sebaceous glands, always associated with hair follicles, producing sebum, this oily mixture that helps to waterproof and moisturize the hair and skin. Uh, sometimes see, uh, sebaceous glands get clogged. When this happens, you can develop acne. A black head and a white head just means your sebaceous gland is plugged with sebum and maybe bacteria. A pustule is when the uh, sebaceous gland begins to stretch as it fills with pus, with uh, white blood cells, plasma from the bloodstream, and bacteria. This can continue and get larger, become a nodule, which can cause rupturing through the hair follicle and potential scarring. And then that can even become bigger than that, becoming a cyst, has a dense layer of connective tissue around it, trying to isolate the infection. And this is very painful. American glands are the ordinary sweat glands that have ducts going up to the surface. They produce what we think of as sweat, which is mostly water and helps us to cool down. The water evaporates and heat gets taken away from our body. You can also have emotional sweating. There's the apocrine gland. The apocrine gland is always associated with secondary hairs, such as pubic hair or axillary hair in the armpit. Uh, these only become active after puberty. Uh, they produce a thick secretion that's eaten by bacteria, and then the bacteria produce the odor associated with unpleasant body odor. Serumous glands found in the ear canal help to produce the earwax that protects the ear canal. And then mammillary glands are also modified types of sweat glands. They instead produce the important milk for infants. Hair is also a secondary structure. You have the hair root within the hair follicle in the dermis and going through the epidermis, and then the hair shaft itself, the part that is um, exposed on the outside. The hair's color is produced by pigments from melanocytes found at the very base of the hair. The hair grows just like the epidermis. Cells divide near the base of the hair root and then get pushed up above them and up above them and up above them and then die as they start heading towards the surface. Um, here's a close-up of a hair root. Nails are another kind of protective structure that's an accessory structure. They are also produced by keratinized cells. Cells grow at the base of or root of the nail and then push forward, push the ones above them forward more and more and more. And they, of course, die as they get pushed further out. And in case you were wondering, that whitish uh, color under the base of your nail is called the lunula. Regulating body temperature, when we get hot, uh, our dermal blood vessels will dilate, increasing blood flow to the skin, carrying heat out of the body. We also sweat, the sweat evaporates, getting rid of additional heat. When we get cold, those dermal blood vessels constrict, less blood flows to the surface of the skin. Our sweat glands inactivate and our muscles may shiver to generate heat. This is all about negative feedback, trying to return to our ideal set point. Uh, if you have hypothermia, your core body temperature is below 95 degrees. This is very dangerous, can lead to death. If you have hyperthermia, your core body temperature is above 106 degrees. You will probably die if you stay at that level. Wounds. Wounds heal when you get cut. Blood will fill into the site. Inflammation will occur as the immune system tries to fight any pathogens entering the body. Blood clots will form. The blood clots will become the uh, the uh, scabs that form over the injury, and then the tissue will begin to repair. And then maybe a scar will be formed if this injury is serious enough. Three types of burn. First degree burns that damage the epidermis. Secondary burns that go into the dermis, damaging it as well. Third degree burns damaging all the way down to the subcutaneous layer and are very serious. 